um, here. My name is Davion Fleming. I am the director of admissions here um, at Le Cremonier High School. Um, today is an opportunity for, for you all to learn a little bit more about some of our, our Hallmark programs. And so um, we will start by talking about our, our, our academic curriculum. Um, and then from there, again, um, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions in Q&A as, as folks are kind of um, talking about that. And we'll try to carve out some time to, um, you know, to answer some of your questions. And then after that, we'll talk about our Center for Civic Engagement and the Public Purpose Program. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about um, our, what we call the SHOPS program, um, and, or our, our technical arts, um, program. And so you'll kind of get, um, the, the different hallmarks, um, and foundation of, of who we are as a school. And hopefully this gives you a really good, well-rounded sense of what your child may be stepping into next year, what you can, um, forecast for the next, um, four years, um, as, as your student comes into Lake really, um, gets this, this great foundation of an educational experience, experience, but also how they will learn for impact and how they will take their learning um, that they have inside of the classroom and apply that um, outside of the classroom, outside of the halls of Lake Women in High School. And so um, now that I have said that, we're going to, I'm gonna pass things over to our Dean of Teaching and Learning. Um, Kate Wiley, and she'll introduce herself and, and, and talk about our academic program. Um, Kate. Thanks, Davion. Can you all just give me, Davion, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I just got a new computer. Great. Just making sure. And do I have um, screen sharing privileges? You should. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, happy to be here on this rainy Saturday morning. Um, love me a little bit of rain. Um, just by way of introduction, before I share my screen, um, my name is Kate Wiley. I am the new Dean of Teaching and Learning. Um, I joined Lick Womerding. I believe this is my 18th year. Um, I'm a history teacher. I am um, a soccer coach. I just transitioned out of the Dean of Students position. Um, I am a San Francisco native. And so um, I actually graduated from university. I don't tell too many people that, uh, but I have self-selected to work at uh, Lake Wilmerding High School. Um, and I'd love to tell you a little bit about our program um, and what I think is special and unique about it and um, sort of what has um, kept me here as an educator um, and why I love to work at this school with these students um, and with these pretty incredible colleagues. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, to offer you sort of a little bit of a snapshot of the um, ac academic program and curriculum map at the school. Um, so let me get this. Okay. And let me just get it into full share mode. Okay, um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, really how the mission lives in the lit classrooms. Um, you know, in particular, I think it's very important that um, a sort of a value statement or a statement of purpose, such as a mission, is actually something that students experience as lived and as practiced, um, both within and outside of their classrooms. So I'd like to share a little bit with you um, of what that actually looks like. Um, so um, if we think about head, heart, and hands, which is a hallmark of the Lick Wilmerding education, um, uh, many folks sort of inquire or wonder what does that look like in, as a practice in teaching and learning in the pedagogy, and what does that look like sort of intertwined, right? So if we think about the, the 3D human being and the 3D student, how do head, heart, and hands actually come together in their learning? So I wanted to offer you a few snapshots of what that looks like um, in some of our classrooms. Some of you may be familiar that um, numbers of years ago, uh, Lick Wilmerding collaborated um, the faculty and staff collaborated uh, to devise what we call our habits of mind, which are listed here as collaborate, imagine, inquire, persist, and reflect. 
Um, but these habits of mind have actually sort of um, been very intentionally and very richly woven into, um, you know, aspects of the teaching and learning at the school. So if I highlight a few examples, you know, for examples in, in our math classrooms, um, students are offered a, a time period of what is called reflection and correction, right? So if they... Um, you know, we're, we're struggling in a particular area on a quiz or on an exam or on a group project. Students are offered a time period of, of reflecting on what worked, what didn't work, and an opportunity to correct that work to really demonstrate growth and demonstrate their learning over time. And they're not sort of measured or gauged against sort of a singular moment in time or a singular discrete sort of learning moment. Um, in our history classes, you know, inquiry is something that is a, a lived practice. So students are sort of taught how to ask questions about how they have come to know what they think they know about the historical narrative and how can questions be a pathway um, to understand different worldviews, to understand and um, the way that narratives sometimes get, get documented. And it's actually a regular practice and a regular form of assessment in the classrooms. You know, in our English classrooms, which is an image that you can see here, students actually have table talk norms at their tables that instruct them how to collaborate together, right? So how to engage in a discussion that is collaborative, where students are constructing knowledge together, where there is a give and take. And so these habits of mind are something that are actually very intentionally woven into the teaching and learning in the, in the classrooms, and actually are then also directly correlated to students understanding their growth and progress in those classes. Um, I know that the representatives of the Center for Civic Engagement will talk a little bit about the larger public purpose program at LIC, um, but I did just want to make note of that it is a core value in our mission and that we do have um, across the school, but particularly for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, um, actually public purpose classes. So courses that um, have woven both the sort of philosophy of being a private school with a public purpose, but also a practice into their courses of partnering with local nonprofits or local schools. Um, and this is sort of a, a, an aspect of both the kids learning um, and then actually an aspect of their, their reflection, their assessment in the classes. So again, just to cite a few examples of those, our performing arts classes this year are partnering with the Homeless Prenatal Program in San Francisco. Um, and, and the classes are actually visiting the Homeless Prenatal Program and then actually doing fundraisers for them at all of our school performances. Um, our Spanish class um, partners with Cesar Chavez Elementary School to foster sort of a mentorship program among the high school and the, the um, younger students. Our cinematic storytelling class this year um, are actually going to be producing short documentaries for local nonprofits. So it's, a, again, an example of the mission sort of living within a classroom and students actively engaging within practicing the, the really the foundational uh, values of the school. I did also want to highlight a couple of other things. One, um, like Wilmerding self-selecting to eliminate um, advanced placement courses. And I was here when that decision was made and I'm a former sort of advanced placement teacher myself. Um, and why uh, I was so in favor of this decision and, and sort of what I've seen since this decision was made is that um, in order to really have a mission-driven education and in particular a head, heart and hands education, um, pre-packaged curriculum doesn't always lend to that. And so to move away from using prepackaged curriculum or a curriculum that is also sort of focused on a, a singular culminating exam, which really drives the entire timeline of your course, I found as a history teacher, moving away from that really allowed me to design curriculum that um, was connecting the head, heart, and hands of students. Um, I, I am valued for and allowed to design curriculum that is both um, challenging for students and, and rigorous for students, but also deeply meaningful and purposeful. Um, and I can flex my curriculum over time to meet the needs of students. And so for me, this, this was very much a mis mis mission driven decision. Um, and I have seen the impact actually um, really be more, I think, intentional, purposeful, meaningful coursework, um, again, versus using something that is sort of nationally curated uh, by the college board. 
Um, and just the last thing I wanted to highlight with Head, Heart, and Hands in particular is that, um, you know, it's something that is not only existing in the teaching and learning, but it actually does exist even within feedback and assessment in our classes. Um, and when I am inspired by numbers of our teaching departments who have really taken sort of an innovative step to actually in their courses, um, the assessment categories, how students are sort of evaluated and graded, fall under the categories of head, heart, and hands. And so students are not experiencing this as a siloed thing that I sort of work with my head in one area of school and my heart in another, but yet that I'm bringing all three of these aspects of myself um, to each of my classrooms and to each of these experiences. Um, I also just wanted to highlight in one other aspect of the mission, which is all walks of life. And the sort of the ways in which this shows up in a Lick Wilmerding classroom. I think pretty important um, to sort of outline it at the beginning is that, um, again, our teaching faculty um, have really, you know, moved into a direction um, of really acknowledging that as students are entering their classroom spaces in those first few days of school, um, in, it's really core to get to know those students and for those students to get to know each other. Um, so that again, sort of the, those pedagogical values and structures of class um, have an opportunity to be all the more successful. Um, and so I did sort of want to take a moment to highlight that um, at this institution, we're very intentional about making sure that students um, have space to share their stories um, and space to come to know each other's stories as part of that process of teaching and learning as they move through the school. Um, and so in particular, teachers um, in those first few weeks of school are very intentional about having classroom exercises or even whole units in the first week or two of school dedicated to belonging and membership where um, you know, students are, for example, writing letters to their teachers um, about maybe their experience of that discipline in the past, ways they love to learn best, ways they wanna be stretched as a learner. Um, students are, are very much encouraged also to spend some time in collaborative conversation, getting to know each other. Um, you know, In some classes, um, students um, sit with a different set of peers every single class until they have had opportunity to sit with every single classmate in that particular class and to get to know their story a little bit. Um, and then that directly correlates with students being able to sort of rely on and trust that they can construct knowledge together, which is also a core value of the school, in particular in many of our classrooms, mathematics and history, um, in the arts classes and technical arts, students are given space to first sort of engage in a period of discovery and inquiry for themselves. Um, before we we necessarily have a teacher coming in as the coach or as the facilitator of that lesson. Um, and so in this way, students are also very much relying on one another. Their skill, differing skill sets, their differing experiences, their differing worldviews um, in order to be able to sort of construct learning together. Um, and then that's, that's complemented by then the teacher coming in and sort of facilitating that process. I also wanted to just highlight some classes where students, I think, are given opportunity to see themselves, their identity, their identifiers, um, their passions, their interests showing up in the lit curriculum. So just a snapshot of a few of those classes where students really can see themselves or their passions represented and across discipline. We've got courses like music and social justice, graphics and game design. You know, the new launch of our ethnic studies class this year, race, class, and gender. So courses where students, again, feel valued and see themselves in the curriculum, um, but also are inspired by their own passions being directly reflected um, in the curriculum. Um, I wanted to give you a little snapshot of sort of what the curricular map is of the school. Um, and I know that this is sort of a lot to, to take in, but I did want to highlight a few things from it. Here again, I, I wanna share that what is reflected in this table of our graduation requirements is very mission-centered. And so when we think about the whole student, for example, that the school has a four-year graduation requirement of a, of a commitment to public purpose, of a commitment to gauging with communities, to engaging with um, taking their education sort of outside of the classroom is directly mission-driven. Um, Body-mind education, that our students take a year and a half of learning that also incorporates aspects of their physicality, of their emotional well-being. The sophomore human sexuality class 
um, where they're also looking at, you know, aspects of that sort of developmental part of their identity. Um, very, very centered in our school are the arts programs, two years of technical arts, a year and a half of visual arts and half a year of performing arts, right? So that students are, are um, that these are not sort of classes that are, are quote unquote relegated to something that is an elective, but are core to, to the student experience as they move through um, the curriculum. I did also want to highlight that within this curricular map a lot, there's a lot of student choice within this. So in particular, our juniors and seniors, there is a lot of student choice of courses that they would self-select to take. And these courses appear both in, let's say, an A UC requirement category or a D UC requirement category, so in science, as much as they also appear as a, as a G elective. So students have choice within sort of a UC category discipline. They can choose their history seminars. They can choose a science science junior senior seminar, but there's also a wealth of G elective seminars um, or courses that students can also um, self select to take. And then lastly, I think an important takeaway is that the Lick Wilmer Dane graduation requirements really poise students um, to be more than prepared for a UC level or CSU level education. Our graduation requirements well exceed what are the expectations for the UCs or the CSUs? So we're also sort of poising students, I think, in a in a um, uh, in a in such a manner that that transition from high school into into collegiate academia that they are sort of more than prepared for that transition. And then the last thing I just wanted to highlight is sort of where we're headed um, from a teaching and learning perspective. So we have our sort of current strategic plan that the school is working on. It was sort of got took a little pause because of um, the quick shift during COVID um, to how teaching and learning had to happen um, in those few years. But we are sort of robustly returning to it this year. Um, and in particular, in this 2022-2023 year, our faculty staff is working on um, a portrait of a graduate project so that we can really sort of identify, um, you know, what are we saying as sort of the Lick Wilmer Dean graduate of the future? We learned a lot um, from the last like three years, and it's given us a great opportunity to sort of reinterrogate and reimagine um, what we what we want as an institution to say sort of we um, our values and what we sort of graduate a student with. Um, and some of the questions that we're going to be looking at to inform this portrait work, um, uh, educate for life is one of the strands of our um, strategic plan. And so a few of the things we're going to be looking at, for example, are we have these core habits of mind. And in many ways, those habits of mind are also related to habits of heart and habits of hand. But we feel like we have not been as explicit and coherent about that. So we're really moving in a direction to be much more explicit and, and coherent about filling out sort of the hands and heart aspect um, uh, so that those habits um, are more known and more transparent across the institution. We're looking very much at how we use time as an institution, and I think that also directly correlates to student well-being and health um, and using time in ways that students feel is both purposeful as well as sort of understandable and manageable. Um, and so we're doing a very deep dive in thinking about what do we want our schedule to be and how do we want to use time, particularly in ways that can amplify other aspects of our program, including public purpose, including affinity work at the school, um, including time for kids to do things like internships. Um, and then lastly, we're really moving in a direction to do more inter and cross disciplinary work. And again, to build more coherence across our program um, so that we can look more in a direction of team teaching um, where students can take a class that could be listed in one elective or another. Um, and, um, and really kind of, again, valuing that sort of 3D student and crafting and designing an educational experience that is equally as 3D because we feel like that's sort of meeting the student um, of sort of this next generation and what's going to be needed as they um, move through high school and then beyond. So um, I know it's a fair amount of information I intended again to offer you a little bit of a snapshot of sort of where we are and where we're going. Um, happy to answer questions, um, whether it's about my experience of the teaching and learning here or what I hold as sort of the larger scope of the academic curriculum. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Stop sharing. You're welcome. I'll stop sharing. <laughs>
Yeah, so if you if you uh, have questions for Kate, please put them in the Q and A. And again, I'll I'll try my best to get to you. But um, just to kick off questions, um, you know, one of the things that's really unique about the ninth grade experience, um, in my opinion, is that students um, our students take contemporary media arts, they take design and technology, um, and they take body mind education um, as kind of their foundational courses, part of their foundational courses. And so, can you? explain a little bit um like the thinking behind um you know in, engaging students in that way mm -hmm. as they come into life yeah so i mean so i think two things stand out um to me about about that programming um i i think first and foremost what you will find particularly in those courses um is that that is actually where a lot of sort of teen teaching and collaborative teaching happens and so specifically in the design, the DNT course and in the CMA course, kids actually do sort of mini units within those courses where they learn all aspects of it. So they might do in CMA a mini unit on architecture. They do a mini unit on video production, a mini unit on multimedia. And each of those units are taught by a different teacher within that department. So what it really allows for kids to have is a foundational experience in that arts discipline to then choose, wow, I, I really love architecture. I think I want to pursue that. Or I really love the painting and the muraling, and I think I want to pursue mixed media. So in a lot of ways, it gives them this foundational experience to then sort of choose passions that they want to pursue. I think the second thing that's really core about these courses, and I share this sort of as a history teacher, in great part, those courses, because we have those courses, we don't have freshmen taking history. Um, their first history courses is, is as a sophomore. What I think is an important value about those classes also is that in, in many cases, students have not had a depth of exposure to um, sort of that deep kind of art work, or for example, in our BME with the, with the yoga and the health and the rock climbing. And so when they come here, I find that for those students, in a lot of cases, they're all starting from the same place, right? It's not like I had a sort of a deeper experience in writing essays. So when I come into English, I'm feeling like, I may be one step ahead, that these are also spaces where really the kids are all starting from the same foundation. And what is so rich about that is they 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 really do have to construct that knowledge together. They really do have to find out what collaboration means. And so I think as freshmen, it really sets them up very well for the things we want them doing in some of those other classes when they get older. Um, and so, so for me, I feel like that's actually a space where um, you know, we we take kids from so many different middle schools and from so many different backgrounds where they're really coming together for that sort of shared common purpose. Awesome. Um, one question that we have, and I actually get this question a lot, um, is can you talk about the homework philosophy? Like what are, what are the, the kind of guidelines um, we, we give our teachers and um, what should students expect? And um, can you also talk a little bit to like, what is the quality of the homework that they get? Right. So, um, you know, we've, we've had sort of a homework policy at the school for quite some time. And we did a little re-interrogation with that, um, certainly with coming sort of out of COVID and, um and thinking again about what is sort of the purpose of homework, which I think, again, that experience of teaching remotely and, and being remote um, was one of those questions that emerged for a lot of us in education. Um, and so right now, I think that the, what we sort of say to the students is that there is sort of a set homework policy that they have that is developmental. So freshmen and sophomores can expect to experience, um, you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes of homework and juniors and seniors 45 to 60. We're also sort of very clear that it, it, it is a little bit sort of the spirit of the philosophy and not the letter of the philosophy. And so in some cases, students might find if they have an exam or they have a project um, that that's going to require a little bit more time that might require a little bit more attention. But then the, the coming off of that project, they're going to have sort of a little window in a period where um, then there's sort of a restart. And so where there's less homework and sort of less time dedicated to something that is sort of a significant project. I've also found in the last like five to six years, faculty being very intentional about setting aside class time. And so whereas I think the dynamic historically, and I know that I certainly did this early in my teaching career, was sort of content, content, content during class, and then like individual learning at home through homework, 
many of our faculty are, are sort of flipping that um, in great part because they want to be able to observe student process. So they want to be able to observe how students collaborate together. Um, you know, if they're doing a research project, how are they accessing things in the library and sort of flipping that so that a lot of the work of, of projects or papers or preparation is happening in class. Um, and then homework is sort of a complement to that. Um, and I think on average, what students will experience in terms of homework is often it's going to be something that is that transition, right? So homework is a bridge. So it's either something that outgrows from what was done in class that day, or it's something to prepare them um, for what's going to be happening in class the next day. And so I think they'll experience homework as something that is contextualized as this bridge um, so that when they come into class the next day, they are sort of aware of and prepared for whatever the nature of that that course is going to be. Um, but again, I think that students will find that um, that that kind of flipped classroom is happening more and more um, in the in the way that teachers are thinking about observing process around what like homework or producing something versus having that be exclusively work that they do at home. Awesome. Last question, I promise. Sure. Uh, um, you shared with us um, just kind of a snippet of the the different electives that we have um, at LIC. And so can you talk a little bit to how some of those electives come to be? Like, are they based on instructor interest? To what extent are yeah. we taken into consideration student interests um, in the formation of, of, of classroom topics, but also just content that's happening within the classes as well? Right. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, we have, I mean, it's electives across, across discipline, um, and I would say that it's a combination of all of those things. Definitely one of the things that keeps me here at Lick um, is this was sort of the first, I've worked in, in a lot of different schools, and my experience here was that um, I was both valued for and encouraged to try new things, to teach new things, to teach the things that I'm interested in and that I love, and so in part, you will find that some of those elective courses are exactly that. It's teachers um, either teaching something that is, is their love, right, that they have spent time um, researching and working on in their own discipline. In some cases, which I really value is teachers are putting themselves in the position of being a learner. So they're teaching something maybe a little bit new to them. Um, that is where sometimes the richest pedagogy happens because you're taking a risk and you're almost designing and curating along with the students. Um, uh, I would say that some of it is definitely identified by either student wish or in some cases what we're finding maybe students might need at this moment or juncture in time. So for example, some new courses being offered this spring, this spring there's an um, ethics and science class. Um, ethics and science and technology, which is also just to meet some of the dilemmas of where we are in the larger scientific community right now. Um, there's a new that my colleague Christy here is offering. There's a new leadership course um, that's being offered this spring. So in some cases, what's driving decisions is to also meet um, uh, maybe the needs of the time. And then the last thing I'll share, some of those electives, what's lovely about them is they also open the door to cross-disciplinary, right, or, or multidisciplinary courses. So we've had historically like a, a, um, a religion in the United States course that was team taught by two humanities teachers. We currently have a music in the brain course, um, which is uh, team taught by a, by a performing arts faculty member and a science faculty member. So there's G electives also in some cases allow for teachers teachers to try something on, and then potentially that course could actually move into from a G elective, let's say to an actual discipline-based elective. So then it's not an elective, then it could be an option in the science curriculum or an option in the history curriculum. So it does allow us to be very innovative and very um, sort of uh, trying on um, some, some new ideas. And I think that those G electives are a very rich place in our curriculum. Awesome. Thanks so much. I really okay. appreciate your time. Of course. Um, folks, there's a ton of questions and we'll try our best to, to answer some of those um, within the, the Q&A themselves. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're, we're moving right along here. I always have the um, the distinguished pleasure of, of introducing um, some of our, some of the, I don't know, some of my favorite folks at, at Lick and, and sometimes those folks 
are our people that will be joining our community next year. And so I, um, if you've come to shadow visits or if you've met me in person before, a handful of times I've been asked, um, what do you think of the uh, of your new hex, uh, your new head of school? And I think that I am not the only one uh, who's really, really excited to have Raj Mundra um, join us next year. Um, he brings 30, 30 plus years of, of educational experience um, to Lake Wormerding High School. And I think the thing that um, I am most excited about, and I think a lot of our faculty and staff have been really excited about, is just how dedicated he has been throughout the tenure of his career um, to our mission as a school. Um, and there is um, there's a really great write-up about him on our website, and you can certainly um, look that up and, and read a little bit more about him. But you know, at every juncture throughout his career, um, it really, in our eyes, um, screamed uh, a lick. And so um, I'm really, really excited that he's here uh, with us this morning. And uh, yeah, I'm going to pass things over to, to Raj. He's going to say a few words to you all. Hey, Raj. Hi, thanks, Davion. And thanks, Kate, for that overview. Um, apologies for the delay in... Um, in getting onto this. Um, I had hoped to get onto it earlier. I'm actually with LIC students and faculty at a national diversity conference in San Antonio. And my tech was just not cooperating. So thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you for joining, uh, taking the time to join the call um, and to learn a little bit more about LIC Wormerding community and programs. Similar to you, I will also be joining LIC next year. I've been fortunate to visit LIC a few times, and I'd like to share with you three reasons why LIC is such a unique independent school. Number one is the people. And it's been very clear to me that over many years and with great commitment, LIC has created an intentionally diverse community of students and adults. I believe this is critical to the learning environment we have a diverse set of ideas and experiences in every class and activity, just as Kate was describing. The incredible student and faculty diversity leads to the strongest education outcomes. And at LIC, the students and adults will welcome you, will support you, will believe in you, and help you to become your best self as you grow in your teenage years. The number two reason is the program. It's an incredibly strong liberal arts curriculum, which will help students to discover more about themselves and more about our complex and interconnected world. The head, heart, hands approach aligns knowledge and values into a program that's meaningful and relevant. Moreover, the curriculum will prepare students well for life after LIC, including college and whatever work they choose to pursue. You'll hear more about the PPP program, which focuses on service learning and citizenship, as well as our workshops, well, where you will learn more about how LIC students imagine, design, create, and share personal pieces with peers and teachers. So number one, people. Number two, program. Number three um, is community. At LIC, students will feel connected. The community has so many talented, smart, independent thinking students, like students on this call. It's engaging, stimulating, and it's not easy. You do not, you do need to work hard at LIC. And our students embrace it. We build community in many ways, including the advising program, arts, athletics, clubs, service opportunities, and other spaces too. We also prioritize our relationship with families, and I'm very proud about that. We know that students and families will both gain and give so much to, their, to, to the LIC community. I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll end by sharing why students will succeed at LIC. Students will succeed because we have a strong sense of belonging. It's a core value. We, we prioritize student health, and we know students will be engaged in their learning. 
trust, care, and curiosity are the pillars of our program. Thank you again for your interest in Lick, and I hope to meet you and your family in person at some point. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, Raj. Um, I think a lot of that really resonates with the the very things that the very reasons why I came to work at Lick, and also all the reasons why I continue to stay at Lick. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate that, um, and I hope that folks found. Um, you know, hearing from you to be really helpful in their formation as to why they may want to, to join our community next year as well. All right. So next, um, the first line in our um, in our mission as a school is a private school with a public purpose. And that is really kind of that really lives and is housed within the Center Pacific Engagement and within our public purpose program. And so we have um, uh, Christy Godinas Jackson and Robbie Lau here to talk a little bit more about that that uh, those programs. Christy and Robbie, take it away. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Robbie Lau. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the director of public purpose at Liquid Morning. This is my first year in that role, and I'm here with my colleague Christy. Hi, folks. My name is Christine Galinas Jackson. I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of the Center for Civic Engagement, and this is my 18th year. And we just want to take a little time to, um, we have our own slides, so I'm going to share those with you right now. Go to screen share. Can everyone see those okay? So the Center for Civic Civic engagement is it, it, it's physically at the heart of the school is right when you come in we're right there on the left hand side and uh, this is us we are uh, there's three of us uh, myself Christine and Yanni who's our senior uh, associate he's not here with us today um, and we want to share some of the activities that we're involved with um, so the public purpose program which has been and mentioned a number of times is basically a requirement at the school and a ninth grade really it's a chance to explore the roots of inequality and volunteerism through basically a series of eight workshops this year and so some of that has been identity exploration exploring different issues around climate change and learning how to dialogue around that and part of the reason that we're integrating identity exploration into civic engagement is because we feel like it's really important before we even step foot off the campus and go out into the public. It's like, who is, who are we? Who's in the room? And why does that matter uh, as part of service? In 10th grade, um, students are required to complete 40 hours of service. And the idea here is that they're really just exploring, like, what are different, all the different issues that are out there? What are all the different organizations that we might get involved with? Some folks choose to just uh, go deep into one or two organizations. Some are just still exploring and want to kind of try a variety of different things. So part of the work of the center is that we create these opportunities as well as it provide the resources for students to go and choose their own public purpose projects. In 11th and 12th grade, um, Kate mentioned this before, but that's when students really can start to engage in some of the public purpose classes. So um, that's also uh, the way that students can, can meet this requirement is either through a public purpose class. Um, they can also choose to de design their own community independent study, and we'll see some of those in a, in a minute. Um, they might work with an, as an intern in a local nonprofit organization, or they might help us to create the curriculum that the ninth graders go through. This is an example of uh, another example of public purpose. We have a philanthropy initiative, which is a class that was endowed very generously. Um, and this class basically explores, goes through a whole process of like values clarification, students figure out what is important to them. And they look at all the different issues in the world locally and globally. And they have to sort of, they have to through a long process decide which organization they're going to eventually donate um, $10,000 to at the end of the year. So it really forces students to think deeply about uh, values, about um, you know issues of social justice and environmental environmental issues and to um, make some tough choices around impact. This is an example of a public purpose class. This is our advanced uh, Chinese class. They partnered with the Climate Psychiatry Alliance 
Alliance, which is an organization that works to um, support folks around mental health issues related to climate change. And the issue of heat death is really significant. And so they partnered with our, our Ch advanced Chinese students to create these documents and translate them into Chinese um, so that um, uh, folks in the community could know how to be safe during a heat wave. And this is an ongoing collaboration. Uh, one of our shop classes is private skills for public purpose. In this class, the students build, they, they partner with different organizations, so schools or other nonprofits, and they go and visit and find out like what is really needed there. And they design furniture or other um, products that are needed by those organizations. So it's really a, a two-way partnership. These are examples of um, some of those initiatives that students took on and really ran with on their own. So um, San Francisco Ignite Leadership and Youth is a youth-led organization that was started by students at Lick um, that really supports middle school students. So they have their own whole program for middle school students. They ran a summer program and during the school year, they've ran, um, I think like six or seven week programs where students are coming, middle school students are coming to learn about leadership skills around um, um, all different issues doing service projects. And that's something that students at Lick are leading. Um, a maker cart, um, Hello Maker is an organization that was started by another student who's a senior now. Um, basically, the student was super inspired by our own shops and realized that most schools and other communities don't have the same resource. So what she did is she created a maker cart um, with lesson plans and resources uh, for local public schools right in our neighborhood and libraries. And so this is something that she's been rolling out on her own. Uh, the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit is an entirely youth-led um, activism network that was started by students at Lick in collaboration with students and other organizations. So they host their own Bay Area Climate uh, Summit, as well as um, environmental justice workshops and ongoing service pro projects. Uh, Fresh Air Now was started by Lick students during the pandemic when they recognized just the importance of air quality, right? We're all kind of learning a lot about that. And so these students um, did some fundraising, they got a grant, and they really um, are working to specifically target um, air pollution in the southeast corner of San Francisco, which is a lower income area. Uh, um, so equipment buildings and schools with fans and technology to support clean air inside. And I'm gonna pass it over to Christy now, is gonna share some of our other initiatives and collaborations. Thank you, Ravi. Um, one of the things that excites me most about being a private school with a public purpose is being able to engage with different partners in the community. So here is just a sample list of some of those partners, and I'm going to highlight a few. AIM High is a nonprofit. They offer summer enrichment programs, and they just had their first program this past summer back at Lick after a two-year hiatus. And a lot of folks don't know that AIM High actually started at Lick over 30 years ago by two Lick teachers. We also have District 7 Youth Council joining us this year, and this is a wonderful partnership where high school youth from uh, District 7 come together to talk about policy changes and really different initiatives that they would like to launch in their neighborhood. And then finally, Tax Aid, which we've been partnering with for over five years, they offer free tax services to families whose income is below $58,000. Last year, they held six sessions at Lake Wilmerdine, and we were able to continue to engage our students on supporting their work, but also learning how to prepare taxes. Um, what I love about our partnerships is that they go beyond just opening up our campus. Um, you should know that Lick does offer free spaces to these partners, um, anybody that is an educational nonprofit or neighborhood association. Next slide. So when I mentioned that we go beyond just sharing our spaces, we are always looking for opportunities to collaborate and engage our students in the community. The first photo you see is of a recent event we hosted, the Freedom to Express Fest, which is a partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District librarians. And it really is just an opportunity for young folks to come together, celebrate arts, and talk about social justice issues that they care about. Uh, tomorrow, we will be uh, co-sponsoring the Youth Art Summit that's hosted by Youth Art Exchange. So feel free to check it out. We will have our own center interns offering a display, and they will also be having some interactive activities. Next slide. 
And then here are a few uh, other examples of some of those community partnerships. Um, earlier this week, we were asked by the Excelsior Action Group if we had any students that would be interested in performing. And this is one of the, the things I love so much about our partnerships is that they can just contact us, you know, within a few days and say, hey, can you help with this? And sure enough, we were able to get two student groups that volunteered to perform yesterday and sing some holiday carols. And then the other photo you see is a partnership with the Ocean Avenue Association to put on their annual block party. Next slide. Over 10 years ago, we partnered with San Francisco Day School to launch the PACT Mentor Program uh, to really support students of color in building connections and really seeing themselves in other members. And we've now grown to over five schools, so San Francisco School, Live Oak, and University High School. We started with a group of 10, and we now at every, we hold events probably once a month. We have over 80 students participating. Next slide. I'm also really proud of the LWHS Community Tutoring Program. This actually started in partnership with AIM High. Uh, AIM High used to host their own tutoring program and then decided that they wanted to focus on their summer programs. So they asked us, could you launch a tutoring program for our, for our students? And we said, yes, absolutely. And so we offer a free tutoring program for fifth through eighth grade middle, middle school kids from public and parochial schools. There are also enrichment sessions that happen every Thursday, which you'll see some of those photos. Uh, the program is currently still virtual because we find that it works for parents. It makes it easier for parents to get their kids on and we can also expand who we're serving. Our tutors are Lick Wilmerdine students. I would say half of them are sophomores looking to earn their PPP hours. And the other half are juniors and seniors who just really have loved tutoring and want to stick with it. Next slide. So the Center for Civic Engagement also oversees leadership opportunities. So I'm going to highlight a few examples. Um, we have over 90 clubs on campus. Here is just a short list. Um, our clubs are distinguished between active membership and passive membership. Active membership clubs are required to meet once a rotation, to host a community offering, and also do service in the community. But what's so wonderful is I would say a large percentage of our, of our clubs are looking for ways to get involved. So whether it be hosting local fundraisers or going out to do service, that is a core part of who they, who they are. Next slide. Our student council, while every school has some sort of student government and student council, I mention them here because I'm really proud of the work that they do. Yes, they plan fun events and they do dances and TGIFs, but in the last 10 years, they've worked really hard to change policies in the school. They have helped lead the way uh, with our hate speech policy to create a changes in our attendance policy so that students can attend social justice events. And we have a new position this year, which is our environmental chairs, which are helping to explore how can we be more a more sustainable school. Another leadership opportunity we have is our Peer Connect Mentor Program, where 10th through 12th graders mentor incoming ninth graders. This is an optional program, but I'm happy to say that close to 90% of our ninth graders enroll. And every month we simply have an event for students to gather, build community, and really find a sense of belonging. Next slide. As Raj mentioned, there is currently a conference going on, the People of Color Conference aligned with the Student Diversity Leadership Conference. And we're proud to be able to send students every year to these three national conferences. So there's SDLC in San Antonio, the White Privilege Conference, and Creating Change Conference. And what's wonderful about sending students to conferences is that they, then they come back empowered and inspired and really wanting to share what they've learned. And so in the spring, the center hosts Sam Mahara Days of Justice, which is an in-house conference planned by students who attended those conferences. This has affinity groups, workshops, keynote speakers, and every year our students choose a different theme to focus on. Last year's theme was ethnic studies. And we named this conference Sam Mahara after one of our alums who has really done amazing work 
to share um, his experience in the Japanese internment camps and how that has impacted his life. Um, so there we go. Next slide. And then finally, I just want to highlight ethnic studies. Um, I have the privilege of being part of the ethnic studies working group this year, and they are in their third year. And we've been working really closely with students to think about what would it look like for Lick Wilmerdine High School to have an ethnic studies graduation requirement. And so next week, we're launching our ethnic studies field trip to go see the Angela Davis Sees the Time exhibit at the Oakland Museum. And this spring, the center will be offering a pilot ethnic studies program that will be co-taught by Robbie Lau and Yanni Velasquez. So this is just a small snapshot of some of the wonderful programs that we have in the Center for Civic Engagement and just really proud of being a private school with a public purpose. Amazing, thanks for that. Um, reminder for folks, um, this is time for Q&A for, for Robbie and Christy. So if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A. But um, there is one, and that is, what is the process for, for joining and or starting a new club? Are there any restrictions around that? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that, that process at the beginning of the school year? You know, I think the biggest thing is that we want clubs to align with, with our mission and, and who we are. I rarely say no to clubs. I think the, the, the biggest challenge is that there are so many students that want to lead clubs that are similar. So we will often give those, those students an opportunity to come together and say, hey, do you want to collaborate? It seems like your mission is aligned. And sometimes they don't. And that's OK, because we want to be able to support students in this journey. Um, and it's really important for us in, in leadership is to hold students accountable. And so every quarter, students have to submit reports to let us know what is your club accomplished? How can we support you? Because we also don't want students to just say they're a club leader and not do anything. And, and sometimes you see that happen. And so it's important for us to offer that support. And like I said, we have over 90 clubs, um, so we can't do it alone. And so having adults, faculty and staff serve as advisors has been crucial to um, support our clubs. Awesome, um, I have a really great question. Just in terms of, it's, it's around um, student council being involved and impacting school policies around social justice. And so can you talk a little bit about how the student body has engaged in um, social justice outside of, or both in um, and during school at Lick, but also outside? So has that meant, you know, marches, rallies, um, different demonstrations? Like how has that really kind of showed itself um, within the student body? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, like, just as someone who oversees student council, they're always thinking and talking about issues outside of outside of school, right? And they're very aware that uh, students that attend a private school, the privileges that they have, and how they really need to serve the community. And so all of student council, the class reps, the executive board, they're required to get out in the community and do different initiatives. Um, when you meant when you brought up that question, the first thing I thought about was, you know, the sexual assault, sexual harassment walkout that we had, that students were heavily involved in planning to really talk about, you know, not just an issue that exists at one school, but all of our schools, right? How are we talking about or not talking about sexual harassment um, and assault? Another issue that's been big, really big for students is mental health. So being able to bring awareness and, and having um, you know, meetings with class deans, with Kate, with the head of school, you know, next next month, they're going to be meeting with the board of trustees to present their work and their findings. And so I think that that's the part that they love most is being engaged with what's happening outside of, of, of the school. Awesome. Um, last question. How, how have y'all kind of thought about um, collecting feedback and incorporating changes into the public purpose program um, and, and, and that program in general, like how has it evolved through the feedback that you've received, both from students, but also from our faculty and staff? Robbie, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, being my first year, I'm really trying to tune into what is happening and what's going on 
throughout the whole school and what's happening with our students. So for example, for our first public purpose days, uh, what I do is after each workshop or after each day is I send out a feedback form, like for all of the, everybody, all the entire ninth grade who were in that program to really ask them like, what landed well for you? What was, what did you not understand? What do you want more of? What are the issues that you're concerned about? So I'm really treating this year, my first year as a chance to um, read the room and to kind of co-create the program with students. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, the kinds of initiatives we take on. So that is really important to me. Um, also, I'm really interested in what the faculty experience is. So I'm actually in the process of talking to a few uh, faculty and actually have a survey that I'm um, sending out to folks who are integrating public purpose into their program to find out what is the you know what is the school doing well that supports public purpose in the classroom around time around schedule structural issues policy issues um what can we do more of where are the pinch points where do we need to grow so that's, those are some of the ways um and also i want to just touch on that last question because i think the person was asking specifically about how does student council impact policy and i know my understanding is that student council actually created a policy so if there's a significant public event like a march or a rally that a lot of students want to attend, there is a way for students to um, to attend and still and, and not uh, receive a cut for that class. So I forget what the exact uh, term is, but I know that we have a policy built specifically around that. Amazing. Thanks so much for your time. Um, yeah, I really appreciate learning a lot about that. Uh, really foundational piece of our of our school because I think that it is something that permeates throughout the the culture and, and community of our campus and it impacts um, the felt feeling of being in the being within the student body. So I really appreciate that. Um, all right. So um, next we will we'll talk a little bit about our technical arts program and. Um, I think colloquially we really we refer to the shops, um, and it's I think it's one of the coolest places that we have on campus. But it is more than just a place, right? And so um, one of our teachers, uh, Andrew Kleinoff, is here to really um, dig into not only the place but also the program and all the and all the richness that is embedded in that program. Uh, Andrew, take it away. All right, thanks, Davion. Um, okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Hello, eighth graders, hello, families. Thanks for taking time to just spend some time on a Saturday to get to know our school. Uh, my name is Andrew Kleindoff, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a circuits and electronics teacher, and uh, I've been teaching in the technical arts for quite a while. I'm also an independent uh, maker and designer and artist. Um, and I'm excited to tell you about our technical arts program, which I believe is one of the defining elements of our school. Um, so. Let me start with, I like to start with like a historic photo of technical arts, just to kind of give context for like why it is. I think it's it's something that's unique in Lick in that it has such a history at the school. So the school started um, as what is called the School for Mechanical Arts in 1895. And it was at that time a trade school. Um, it was tuition free boys only. And, and you know, many people were just studying trades and going straight, straight into uh, an industry. And so the school had things like electric shop and plumbing and cabinet making. And so this is a picture of the plumbing shop um, from, I think this is around 1910 or 1915. Um, and obviously, like shops have changed. We're not in the early 1900s anymore. And so, um, but the school has kept this long term commitment to hands on making, which I, I feel like is pretty unique. You know, like there's lots of trends around maker, maker spaces and and getting students into project-based learning. But for Lick, it's just always been part of its history. And so, you know, we've updated things with newer kinds of machines and techniques and new technology, CNC, 3D printing, circuit board design, things like that. Um, but we still have remained true to that sort of hands-on element of the school. And so this is kind of our um, mission statement for the department with hands-on processes and projects at the core. LW Technical Arts teaches at the junction of design and engineering and craft in service of connection, community, and purpose. And so I want to highlight just those three middle words, starting with design, what that means to us. So for us, um, you know, it takes different forms. You know, a lot of it, it, since we're making physical things, is about considering form as it relates to function. How, how is what I'm making look and how is it going to work for myself or for someone else? 
but also we do teach uh, in the vein of, of design thinking as well, which is really thinking about how is somebody experiencing something. And sometimes that's a physical object and sometimes that's actually an event of some kind. For engineering, we try to bring in what we, what we know students are learning in math and science and give them ways to make it tangible. Um, and, and we're not the only department that does that. Math actually will sometimes send their students to us specifically for uh, exploring different things, but we try to like incorporate what we think they're learning in other classes and, and make those things physical. And then for craft, it's about thinking, you know, I think a lot of students are used to assignments that are maybe assigned and then they are due like one or two days later, or maybe sometimes they have a project that's a week long, but many things that are built in the technical arts take them um, weeks just to learn the techniques. And, and, and also some of them, what they see is they have to learn things over a series of years, actually. And so what we tell them as ninth graders is like, you're just exploring, you're learning your techniques because you're going to get better and better at this. So you're going to build that craft personship and you're going to build patience, persistence, and focus. And that's just so important to us in what we do in the technical arts. I mean, you just cannot make a lot of stuff without that building that patience, persistence, and focus. Everything's process-based. Um, we teach students long processes of planning, prototyping, iteration, really not settling on early ideas, um, giving as much detail as you can about what you want to do and what's involved and what kinds of materials are required. And collaboration is just absolutely essential, as it is with all parts of the school. Um, classroom community, which, which Kay Wiley was talking about, it's just, uh, we really, we, we are certainly in charge of the classroom, but like we really emphasize peer-to-peer -peer learning. We might, for example, teach one student how to use a tool and be like, you're going to be in charge of making sure other people know how to use this tool well. Um, a lot of projects in the classroom, like there's no classroom where you're just making something for yourself the whole time. All classes involve collaborative projects as well and really um, teaching students how to tap into each other's expertise and celebrate each other's differences. Um, in the end, though, we just want theory to become physical. So we, we certainly have classes that spend a lot of time um, in the computer and maybe have reading components and research components, but we do really try to incorporate a hands-on element into every class that we have in the technical arts. Uh, it Actually, just the reason I use this picture is that this has really turned out to be a math project. So this is a wood turning project, which is very traditional craft, but the student had to use trigonometry to figure out his cut so that he could build this elephant image out of the stacked boards before he turned it. So again, I just thought it was like a really nice combination of sort of craft and mathematics. Um, you know, and, and students, their interests change. And we, you know, the school is, is so I've been here a while and I'm going to say it's just the most diverse that it's been. And, the, and there's the most different interests that are showing up in the classroom ever. And so we're kind of constantly asking students you know, what are they interested in? What do they want to know more about? And, and just sort of watching what they're, what they're latching onto and what excites them. And so we are, we try to change our curriculum often. We're, I, I'm constantly rewriting my own and I know a lot of the teachers in the department are doing the same. Um, but when we're no, a lot of students look at the work and they're sort of like, well, I don't know, I, I don't really make things, so I don't know if this is the right school for me, but we are a no experience required program. We don't expect people to come in with skills. We certainly get students that come in with a lot of skills, but that's not a part of our program. We think we're really good at teaching a variety of skill levels and offering class spaces where no one feels like an outsider. Um, and, but in the end, we really want students to feel like they're learning things they didn't know they could do, and that we, we believe in creative confidence, creative courage, and that we just know from watching students, they'll come in, they'll be timid, they'll be afraid of machines, of techniques, that I'm not good at this, I can't, I can't build things, but they do it. And then in the end, I mean, I just had a student yesterday who, who was, were building amplifiers and hers played music. And she was like, I can't believe it. I'm, I've made something and it's playing music out of it. So we just see every day that sort of confidence built when students make things happen in the shops. Um, I wanna highlight just a couple of our specific courses. So this is mentioned, but there's a ninth grade course that everyone takes is called Design and Technology. And it introduces students to all the different tools, techniques and the design process. And we start with design thinking just as a concept, like how do we first understand who we're working for or making things for, define the problem, ideate on it, prototype it, test it. Um, we also do 
introduce students to design drawing, which is like really quick ways to get your idea out so you can describe it. Um, we move into 3D modeling. Um, we spend a lot of time 3D modeling with students and it's one of our primary tools for, before they build. Um, this We do some creative projects with them. This one's called Future Furniture. And so we write all of our own tutorials and stuff. We use this software called Rhino 3D, which is popular in the architecture world. Um, and, and you know, as ninth graders, many of them come in with, with minimal to no 3D modeling, but they're able to build some pretty complex things pretty quickly. We really tailored our program to kind of bring everyone in quickly. Um, and then we, the big project of the year is they have to design a, a light. And so it's just something that's going to light up, but it's going to utilize um, a specific amount of wood, metal, and acrylic, and then a programmable circuit. And so these are just some of the things students build. And so everyone is working from the same materials, and yet we're able to uh, get really different results and, and introduce them to a whole bunch of tools and techniques and then end up with something that works, that's exciting, that they can add to their early portfolio. And, you know, like every year, like, you know, the shoe stepping on the gum and then the gum is lighting up. I mean, I just, I can't imagine what students are going to come up with each year. Um, they just wow me. You think like, what can you do with a slab of wood, a slab of metal and a slab of acrylic? But students uh, every year are finding new and amazing ways um, to do things with them. Um, so then once you finish that ninth grade year, you can choose a path. And we have quite a few classes. Um, students have to take at least two before they graduate. So one of our programs is called wearables. And in the wearables program, we have jewelry making. And so for students who really want to get into, I'd say like finely crafted small work wearable, um, we use silver, we use copper, we use um nickel, things like that. And so, you know, this, I'd say it's one of the more meditative mediums. I mean, it, there's a lot of handwork involved, sometimes found objects. Um, but it gives a lot of space also for expression. Um, here are some, these are some acrylic rings that students made. Uh, on the left here, this is a, it was actually done on a CNC machine and then the student formed it and pickled it. So again, it's like machine versus hand, uh, machine meets hand in ways that we find exciting. We, we have a lot of those kinds of crossovers. We also have in our wearables program a sewing and textiles. So students would learn how to sew, work from patterns. Also some of the aspects of fashion design, thinking about self-expression, but also um, talking about some larger issues in fashion like fast fashion and disposable fashion. Um, but here you can see all these were designed by students, usually it's a project is thrown out and then students can choose things, what, what kinds of materials to put together, what kinds of patterns. Um, woodworking is just always one of our favorites. Um, it just has a lot of demand. And I think it's because if you've worked with wood, it's just such a beautiful medium. So uh, we do a lot of traditional woodworking, including wood turning and joinery. Um, students learn about the table saws, about finishing the wood, um, but we also have some newer tools as well. We do some CNC work with them. There's some segment turning. So this, this one on the right is a good example of like many mediums coming together. So this student, um, he, he took this class called Algorithm to Object, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so he was able to algorithmically create this water pattern and see it, see it out of the wood. Um, and then he knew some electronics, so he built like the circuit for this lighthouse. And then, of course, the, the lighthouse itself is made with wood turning. And so it's like it's really bringing a lot of different techniques together. Um, none of our classes are really just one thing or another. Uh, and in the wood shop, we get, definitely get some really ambitious students. And so this student made a guitar. We had a few guitars made. Um, but yeah, just a lot of beautiful work, stuff that I, I can even imagine some of it I, I've wanted to purchase myself from them. They're just some beautiful stuff. Um, on sort of the engineering end, we have a class called graphics and game design in which um, students work on different coding projects. So one of them is that they have to research a history of textiles and they choose like an inspiration and then they have to using code design their own textile. And so here are just some examples. These are actually the swatches. So then we take and we actually print the textiles and then they have to sew it into a physical thing. And so again, this is that combination of engineering and craft. So you're starting in the computer, really just learning 
all different like loops and functions and how do variables work and how do I rotate my graphics and change the colors and then you're pr you're printing it out and then you're eventually making it and you end the class by sewing something and so here are some examples of things student made and part two of that class is um, they do a game and this is a collaborative project so they develop the entire game it's just a two-dimensional game um, but they have to think about all the different aspects like how how are the mechanics going to work what kind of graphics are they going to do and and um, and then how is it going to be fun how are they keeping score if that's part of it uh, we have another computing class this ties into what the center was talking about the public purpose program um, community computing uh, centers around the idea of making software or an experience using code for someone else so here are some students going out to different schools and creating um, just some coding experiences for them. Um, the one on the right here was just this last year at, at Cobb Elementary in which one of our teachers has a student there. Um, and then we have in our, a metal shop, we do a lot of furniture design. So just some examples of that. And um, again, it's very cross-disciplinary, but students would learn about like welding and using CNC, plasma cutting, uh, milling, turning, uh, but often it will also incorporate woodworking, sewing, uh, and some of the projects are collaborative and turn out really fun. Here's an exhibit in the front of the school where you can see, like, so again, these are, you know, from the furniture, some of these are from the furniture making class, but a lot, there's a lot of woodworking as well, even though it's taught in the metal shop. We're very cross-disciplinary in that way. And, you know, one of the things that students will tell us when they go and they come back and visit is they're like, well, so I went to college and I actually did not have as much access to the tools, to the techniques and to the teachers as I did at Lick. And, we're, you know, in a way, we're proud of that. It's kind of a bummer because you think, hey, you want to you want to go on to college and have it be even a richer experience. But I think, you know, what what happened, you know, what we created at Lick is really unique. It's just they have tremendous access to us and to the tools. And so, uh, you know, we really get to know them and we really get to know their design process and, and we're able to mentor them, I think, in a very individualistic way. Um, I teach the circuits in electronics, so we focus on electronic components. How do they work? How does electricity work? We design circuit boards um, and we get those made. Um, this one of our big projects that I, it's very popular is making amplified speakers. So I, I run them through a process of designing the circuit, building on a breadboard, making the circuit board, and then they have to design an enclosure and make it actually sound good. And so here you can see some examples of how that turns out. And then I teach another class called Device Invention, and it's, it's more focused on Internet of Things and Internet-connected devices. And so we do some stuff with Raspberry Pi and some Internet-connected microcontrollers. Um, and then there's a lot of themes. So this year, one of the themes was um, thinking about uh, wellness and, and well-being. And so this, this group thought like, well, if you want to feel good, you need someone to give you a high five. So they made a high five robot. Um, and this group, these are actually a couple of student council folks. Um, they were you know really thinking about the idea of consent. And so they wanted to build a, like a keychain breathalyzer so that you know the idea is that you could actually figure out what your state was. Could you even give consent in the moment? And so this is their little keychain breathalyzer. We, we tested it with um, alcohol wipes, which is probably not the most accurate thing to test it with, but it, it did work at least with alcohol wipes. Um, and then here's another group that was thinking about public transit. And so they did, uh, they used the, the K and T Muni lines and they were able to get the live data. And then they 3D printed this map and embedded lights in it. So you could see a real time map of where the different trains were. Um, and then, you know, the, the pandemic was hard for us as teachers, but it also opened a lot of opportunities. So just, I just wanted to show this really interesting one. So I hooked up with this now parent, Jeff Linnell, who works, he has this company called Formit. He's actually the, started the company. And so the, during the pandemic, I was able to invite different people in and he, he was working on the software that would allow us to control these robotic dogs remotely. And so the students during the pandemic were able to, from their home computer, control this thing. Um, you know, I don't know about these robotic dogs, they're a bit terrifying to me, but regardless of what you think of them, it's pretty exciting to be at your home and, and like make this thing walk around a studio. Um, one other class that we have is, uh, it's called 3D printing and parametric design. 
And so we, tr again, we're trying to incorporate a lot of math and science. So here we're using um, a node-based visual programming language in which students create geometry, but they're able to use algorithms to create that ge geometry. And then we use some outside services to 3D print and very like different kinds of materials like metal, sandstone, and some higher end acrylics and higher end plastics. And um, also again, back to the center. So for public purpose in the shops, it shows up in different ways, but we do have one class that sort of like, I feel like one of the earliest public purpose classes and, and Rami mentioned it, this private skills for public purpose class in which students partner with nonprofits and then they build something for that nonprofit. And I think what's so great about this class is that it really teaches students this sort of idea of like a client and designer relationship. And what the teacher does is, you know, the teacher will make the connection and then the students are, are really responsible for like 90% of the communication and making sure they have to go visit the organization and figure out what they want. And then they have to communicate regularly about like, how's it going and, and what's it looking like? And so, you know, I think, you know, some of the projects are more successful than others, but I, I definitely know that students get a lot out in terms of leadership and being able to have, be accountable to um, someone that you're designing for. Uh, and finally, I just want to highlight, like, so like a lot of people are like, so how do people use shops and as they move forward? So these are just, you know, one of the things about being a teacher is if you have a LinkedIn account, like 90 five percent of your LinkedIn connections are going to be like your ex-students that's what, at least that's what mine are so I get to see the good thing about that is I get to see all the things that they're working on so this is one of our alums who's working at a 3D printing company and who actually was able to work on this custom sole for these Adidas shoes that was 3D printed um, and here's another student these are both students I invited in to speak during the pandemic actually because I could have them on zoom but he's doing laparoscopic robotic surgery um, and, you know, both of them talked about specifically, you know, they, they got a lot out of college, but like Lick was the thing that sparked them to head into these, down these paths. And, and I think we're proud of that. Um, here's a couple more that I just screenshotted from my, from my LinkedIn feed. Um, the student, Kevin, who I knew really well, he's working in um, just like autonomous delivery service and his company, Neuro. And then another student, um, his name's um, Troy Mock. He has his own company, furniture company called Formless now. And he's just building his custom furniture. And I just want to end with a quote. I like to kind of ask my students, you know, what do you think is the value of a program like this? And I think this is a great quote from, from Elliot in 2019. He said, tech, art, tech arts means everything to, to in my high school experience. It strengthens my problem solving skills, my perseverance, my precision and my craftsmanship all skills that I take with me and use in my other classes. The tech arts program at Lick truly pushes me to think deeply about how my actions can be used to contribute to the world with confidence and compassion. All right, that's all I've got. Um, thanks for listening. Um, I can answer a few questions if any came in. Awesome, thanks so much, uh, Andrew. I think um, some folks will, will have some, some questions coming through. But, you know, one question that I've gotten um, a handful of times now is um, in what ways do you feel um, how we've built out the curriculum really welcomes in um, students from, you know, traditionally underrepresented backgrounds? Um, so that could be racially, ethnically, it could be um, uh, gender expression into the shops and, and helps them flourish over time. Yeah, that's a great question, Davion. Um, I mean, I think first of all, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the what have been the dominant folks in the shops in the past, right? You know, like like for example, the metal shop. I mean, you you think is it was like a space for dudes for a long time for like, and so you know we start by with that and then say, okay, so how do we bring, create an experience where people are going to come in and they're going to feel like this is my space. This is not a space that really belongs to someone else that I'm just here to learn a couple of things and, and slide through. Um, I think also like, I think what Kate Wiley said about like spending a lot of time building community in the classroom first and also like elevating voices of the folks that, that maybe you can tell like right away aren't sure that this is a space for them. Um, and then 
everything we do ties into, I think, current topics. So I'm just going to give one example from my own class. So I do this, I do a thing where I start with a five minute current topics and inspiration in, in the analog and digital. And so we're building speakers, but like what I tell students is like technology is tremendously impactful in our life in all these different ways. It's impacting our politics. It's impacting our socioeconomic experiences, so much about it. And so what I do is they have to choose from three categories. It's one is like choose a technology that they think centers BIPOC folks, choose a technology that they think addresses a social justice issue, or choose a technology that is cr like creating a more sustainable life and experience for humans. And so then we have one of those every few classes. And so then it, it gets us out of the idea that we're just like there to have fun and just build things, which we are, but also that these things we're building and that if students go on to be engineers, to be designers, that they're gonna have to consider like all kinds of people and not just, you know, it's not just about making fun gadgets. Awesome. Um, let's see here. I have a question that is uh, hopefully this is a, an easier question. Just how many how many teachers are working in the in the tech arts classes? And um, I think an extension of that is um, you know typically how large are those class sizes? Yeah. So we have uh, seven people working. Um, a few of those people are part time, but but most people are. It's pretty tight group of teachers. In fact, Davian can attest that we, we sit for lunch almost every day together right outside the shops. Part of that is because we need to be close proximity in case someone's working, but um, it's a tight team that we work really well together. But yeah, there's about seven of us. Our class sizes are 16 to 17. Um, we've kind of we've kind of been able to hold that number a little tight because there's actually a point when it becomes a little bit unsafe, especially in the wood shop, especially when you have ninth graders, if you have too many people and they're all at once kind of doing too many things. But we're also, I do want to, since I imagine safety is a concern for people, I do want to say we're just, it's, it's one of our top concerns and we're really, we are um, OSHA approved and we do spend a lot of time trying to create the safest possible atmosphere and teach students a lot about safety. Awesome. Uh, last question. What are you hoping for um, in the technical arts program in the future? Oh, what am I hoping for? Um, I don't know. I mean, I have to say the school has just been tremendously supportive of this program. Um, I can't like I just I, I feel super grateful all the time that to be teaching at this institution and in this program it is it's truly fun it's it's hard work it really is like I don't want to make it sound like it's just fun all the time but but it's just so rewarding and I think honestly I just like I just want to continue I hope the school just continues that support and I, and and people continue to see value in the hands-on work um you know, I, I I think I'm more grateful for what I have than than thinking about the future so much. But you know, I I definitely I'm one of those people that I, I've I've I'm always like grabbing new tools and bringing new tools in. So I'm happy to like at some point like nerd out about like what tools we could get and stuff. But I think you know in general like I'm pretty happy with where the shops are headed, and I just hope we can just keep that same trajectory and just continue to have great colleagues and great students and make great projects. Beautiful. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it, Andrew. Um, awesome. So um, now that we're <clears throat> at the tail end of our session today, we're going to end with a student panel. And so um, students that are on, if you could uh, turn on your, your cameras. Um, and let's see here. Um, let's start with introductions. Um, and again, if you have questions for our students, please put them in the Q&A, and I'll do my best to, to get to them. Um, so let's do um, name, um, pronouns, if you're comfortable sharing those, um, where you went to middle school, um, and uh, a couple of things that you do um, outside of the classroom. And I will pick on Henrietta to go first. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Henrietta. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently a junior at Lick. Um, and previously, I went to a K-8 school in Marin um, called MCDS, or Marin Country Day School. Um, so Connie also went there. Um, and outside of the classrooms at Lick, 
I am involved in a sport every season. Um, the fall sports season, I kind of switch it up a bit. I've done field hockey, I've done cross country um, and winter sports, which is currently, I'm currently on varsity soccer. And in the spring, I will be on varsity track and field. And I encourage all your children to join sports teams at like their amazing communities and I adore them. Um, I'm also involved as a club leader in a lot of things um, that I just am passionate about. I started a personal finance club this year to try to educate students about personal finance. Um, and I started a banned books club because I wanted to read a bunch of banned books. In this spring, I'm thinking of starting bread club um, because a lot of my personality is that I really like bread. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for coming. You get to choose who goes next. So Connie, just because, you know, MCDS kids. All right. Hi all, my name is Sakani. I use he, him pronouns. I also attended MCDS K through eight. Um, some things I'm involved in on campus, uh, sports, I play basketball and then run track. And I'm also in the performing arts program. So yesterday we had a performance where I played bass guitar. Um, and then I'm also the, the co-vice president of the school with my wonderful partner, Kara. Uh, Will. Hi, I'm Will. Uh, I'm also a senior. I use he him pronouns. Um, I went to a K through eight school in the Richmond district of San Francisco called Star of the Sea. And on campus, I'm the captain of cross country and badminton. Um, I play violin, viola in the orchestra, and I'm also one of the leaders of Asia Club. It's really nice to virtually meet all of you. Um, Julieta. Um, hello, my name is Julieta. Um, I'm a senior and I use Shaker pronouns. Um, I went to SF Friends, which is also a K-8. Um, in terms of sports, I played volleyball, tennis, and softball, um, and then some other um, places that I worked in was that I'm part of the ethnic studies curriculum um, working group that you heard about. I was also a center intern for two years. Um, and then I also um, tutor students. So I was a TA for chemistry and algebra two accelerated. And then I also TA students individually. Sorry, <laughs> Olivia. Um, I'm Olivia, I use she, her pronouns, and I went to St. Paul's um, Episcopal School in Oakland, so I take BART here every day. Um, and some things that I do, um, I've done a lot of various sports, like swim, cross country, volleyball, um, I was in the fall play. Um, I write for the school newspaper, the Paper Tiger, and I'm involved in various clubs like Latinx Unidos and um, Lit Mag and Art School's Literary Magazine and that sort of thing. Um, oh, is that everyone? That's okay. everyone. All right. Um, first question. Um, so a number of you mentioned that you're part of the, the sports program. So a couple of, so can a couple of you just talk a little bit about um, just how often are practices, how long, um, and how long typically are, are those practices? I can take this one. Um, I can only talk specifically for uh, basketball and track, but for varsity basketball, it's a five day or six day commitment, I should say. So um, at least for varsity, we have practice um, five days a week and then also practices on, on Saturday and then games all throughout those times. Um, so it's definitely a large commitment, but uh, I think it's worth it. Builds a lot of perseverance, teamwork, determination, stuff like that. And it's also just really fun. You should do sports if you enjoy them. So. To add on, I think it adds a lot of time management skills. Um, I know for me, getting home each day around 7 p.m. because of the commute, um, I really have to crunch in my junior year because the homework load does increase and um, I want to challenge myself with my coursework. So that means I'm taking classes that have heavier course loads, um, but it's taught me how to really manage my time, splitting between chores. I make dinner for my family sometimes um, and that takes up more time than sports. And yeah, but like Sakani said, it's a great community building thing. And also it's good to learn how to dedicate yourself to something and that um, you have commitments and that you're committed to a team. 
Um, and you need to show up every day to put in your effort and your dedication to the team. Um, that's, those are very valuable life lessons that sports at Lake also teach you. Um, Olivia, you live in uh, in the East Bay. I think you said you live in Oakland, right? And so can you talk a little bit about um, your commute and how and in, in the ways in which that impacts your social life and academic life? Like, how do you manage, um, you know, playing sports and riding on BART every day and your friends and your family? Yeah, so that was something that I was really thinking about coming to Lick um, is how I would sort of manage all that. I take BART from the San Leandro station. Um, so there's not that many lit kids who ride on that station, but I know for some stations like Rockridge, there's um, a group of people that gather and, and go together. But um, yeah, so it usually takes about 35 or 40 minutes to get there. And I think it's really helps with my independence since I sort of, I'm able to, you know, get home myself and, you know, manage when I need to leave for school, when I need to leave for home and, and really make use of my time. Like on BART, I like to do homework or read or do things that I feel like I normally wouldn't have as much time to do. Um, so yeah, with sports and that sort of thing, um, the practices usually end at around six. So um, yeah, I have to sort of get home myself after that and with sort of social um aspects it's it's like you know it's um just getting used to being able to go into the city for um you know various weekends or like having people come closer to me so it's really like just sort of finding a balance between that and and yeah I think it it's it's really just sort of help me manage my time and build my independence. And yeah, I, I actually really don't find it, even though that was a big thing that I was sort of worried about when first coming to Lick. Awesome. Um, Will and Julieta, you both um, came from, from very different middle schools. And so can you each just um, talk a little bit about, <laughs> um, excuse me, what your transition was like um, coming to Lick and, you know, what were some of the challenges and how you, how you worked to get through some of those challenges that you experienced? Um, I think my main concern when I was thinking about my transition to Lick was socially, since I had gone to the same school for nine on like 10, 11 years. And I was really nervous to meet new people, but I think like really transitioned me into it well. Like, I think the first thing that comes to mind was running cross country because it, the practices actually started before school started. So I felt like I had like kind of like a community, like a small group of people who I really felt like I could go to even before orientation started. And then orientation was definitely the next thing. Everyone, as a like student, you're placed in an advisory, which is like pretty much like, I think like around 11 kids with one fact staff advisor. And it, you are with that advisory for four years, like all throughout your experience at Lake. And that was also like a really nice like place where I was like, okay, I have people. And that all kind of led up to like the first day of school when I felt like I was still like kind of nervous since there seemed like there were a lot of other people coming from the same middle school and they kind of already knew each other, which was pretty frightening for me. But everyone at Lick, I think, is so open minded to meeting new people that everyone was just so kind and like welcomed me right away. Like everyone in classes was just super open. Like the first like few days of classes, I remember as just being like, like, let's get to know each other. Let's like get to know the teachers and like let's get to know like what we're doing in the class before settling in and I thought that was really really beneficial for me um yeah very similar for me um the big thing that I first noticed was the sense of community um I also played sports in the fall and so getting that first experience with like experience with a team was really helpful um in my middle school I went to family white institute and I was one of to Latinas and that was really hard for me and when I went into like and saw the amount of people who had this shared experiences with me 
uh, was really important and really special for me. And it was something that I'll always remember because it was the first thing I noticed. Um, I forgot to mention this before, but I lead two clubs. I'm president of Latinos Unidos, and I also lead Women of Color in STEM. And the reason that I lead Latinos Unidos is because of the sense of belonging and purpose and community that I found going to those meetings freshman year um, and having this shared space with all these people who were generally wanting to be mentors and talk about experiences and talk about culture and celebrate our culture, and which is the reason that I ended up going up into leadership. But that was definitely one of the biggest things that um, I will remember from my first weeks at Lick. And in terms of challenges, I, th I think the only challenge I had was that in my English class, and I was like, what does this mean? Because <laughs> they kept throwing it around. But within like a few days, it quickly got resolved. Um, because there is an uh, integrated transition into the curriculum, so it's not meant to just push people in, and it's really made to incorporate students and experience and range from different middle schools, and it doesn't really matter where you went, because eventually we will all be in the same spot, and the teachers really care for accommodating and really making the transition a good transition for you personally. Cool. Um, I have a two part question, but I would love it if maybe three of you answered the first part of this question um, and maybe try to stick to one thing. Um, but what do you love most about Lick? I think for me, I would say I love how connection focused Lick is. I feel like every day is really focused on like interacting with different people from like different backgrounds and like what I can learn from someone who has like a different perspective from me and like just like interacting with my teachers and like getting close with them I feel like is pretty much like the heart of like every like experience every class is so collaborative so I am like I feel like I'm always just talking with different people in my classes which I just really really love For me, I'd say the main thing I enjoy about Lick is the passion that the students have. Um, whether that be like passion inside classes. I remember in freshman year, I came into an English class and in middle school, there'd be like four or five people that would contribute to discussions, me being one of them. But um, I came into Lick and like, I couldn't say my point because like everybody was raising their hand trying to make their point. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty awesome. Um, but passion stretches farther than the classroom also to like different clubs that people are in. It's just like the things that they enjoy and the hobbies that people have, they go at them uh, wholeheartedly. And I think that builds a wonderful community where everyone works really hard. Um, I would say that one of my favorite things is the support that you get at Lick, just from the general community. Like whenever you would like to like meet with a teacher or discuss um, like something that you need help with in class, like that's always so accessible and available. And um, there's like so many programs like peer tutoring and peer connect and like where you can connect with um, students of different grades. And, um, I, and there's like math cafe, which is if you have like um, twice a week there's a classroom where you can go and there's always math teachers who are always willing to help you with anything that you're struggling with and I feel like the lit community is just so um, is just like so wanting to help and support students and they have so many different things in place that really um, make sure that that happens. All right so for the second part of that question what do you wish was was different? Not to be a pessimist, but I can answer this one. Um, I think two things that come to mind um, are things that I think a lot of schools can work on in general and as a world we can work on. Um, I think of the waste we produce as a school and Lick is very, very good um, about 
it's taking into account our footprint, our environmental footprint, but there are some areas for improvement, just like anything. Um, and as students, um, like inspires us to take initiative and to look, work to solve those issues. And there are currently, I think a lot of initiatives working to solve both our food waste and paper waste right now. Um, I know sometimes I'll get a handout in a class that's printed and it's like color ink. And I'm like, do I really need this? This is just a random cover of a book. And I don't necessarily need to see the cover of a book on the printout in class. Um, and so it's just smaller things like that. I think that requires a mindset shift, um, but by changing the culture at our school first, we can hope to then expand that to the larger world. Food waste as well. I know our environmental chairs this year are working with um, the Food Justice Club. I'm really bad at acronyms and club names, so I just kind of made that title up, but there is a club that is working on that. Um, and I think, oh yeah, okay, that is the right thing, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that's a great example of how like um, handles these things because they take into account student feedback um, and the students are the ones driving the change most often. Um, I can answer this as well. I think mine like very much like Henrietta is not necessarily unique to like and it's something that can still be worked on. Um, but I think they're in upper level like math and science courses, there's some um, like connotations or biases that limit women to be able to take those classes. And it's not an issue that's special to like, and I've been in conversations with other private schools in the city that have are experiencing very similar things. Um, and I go to a conference every year called the Riot Conference, which addresses these issues and we talk through them. Um, but it's always a place for improvement, which is where just some teachers can acknowledge um, the difficulties in being like a woman in any upper level class and just understand what that means. Um, but there are steps that are being made to work through them. I've talked to several deans about it and they all are completely agree and are working towards it. Um, so I do feel very supported and I'm in honors campus right now and I've been in the honors track and I feel very supported by my deans, even if it in specific experiences in class, there's certain times where I'm like, okay, well, that wasn't the best. I know that there are people who are still actively working to support me and help the next generation to not feel the way that I did. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, I think um, a, a major part of our school that hasn't um, been touched on um, quite um, quite as much today, a little bit, but it's just the the different affinity groups on, on, on campus. And so I know that, um, that, that many of you are, are involved in some way, shape or form of different um, affinity, uh, affinity groups based on your, um, your different identifiers. And so um, can a couple of you just talk about like the different affinity groups we have um, and some of the things that, that, that you do um, within those or clubs? Yeah, I am a part of Asia and I'm also part of the Gender Sexuality Alliance. And I joined Asia when I was a frosh and I came from a school that had a lot of Asian people, but I was never really like enabled to kind of like access my, like I never really felt like I was able to discuss my identity. And coming into Asia was, it just felt like I was really like validated. Like I felt like all of my experiences coming into Lick and like at Lick, it felt like I was very like understood and heard and which is why I worked and I ran for leadership. And now I'm one of the leaders, we have nine leaders of Asia club and I'm one of them. And our meetings are just like the best. Like I I have so much fun just leading it and it just feels like a safe space. And I'm, I really hope that I'm fostering that kind of safe space that I looked for when I came into Lick. We do a bunch of meetings from like, I guess ones that aren't serious. This week we had one on Asian street food and we cooked dumplings and we gave them to everyone. That was really cool. You guys should have been there. But um, <laughs> we also, I also hosted a meeting this earlier this year on Asian masculinity, which is like 
something that I hadn't actually really thought about a lot, but like just researching it, like, and being able to present about it, it made me, it helped me like learn a lot about myself all the while. Like I, there are a lot of like freshmen Asians in the room. And I really hope that I was able to foster like a safe space and validate their experiences as well. And it's been a very, very fulfilling experience for me. And I'm super, super grateful that I've been able to be a part of Asia club. Um, I can speak on behalf of Latinas and Unidos. Um, we, our goal is to basically build belonging and community. Um, and we, so I've been president for two years and non leadership for three years. Um, and so last year, our goal was to basically, we themed it around familia and just like building family, community. Um, and that came up after COVID was just having a space where we could just be together do some activities, talk, listen to music, and just like be together was the whole point. Um, we also are in charge of celebrations. Um, so if you've been to an open house at school or have been on a campus, you probably see that we have our we had our Dia de los Muertos altar up um, for November. And then we also decorated the lobby wall for Hispanic Heritage Month, where we honored all the Latinx and Hispanic faculty and staff at Lick. Um, just a little bio about them and what they do and their importance to the school. We re basically wanted to honor all the voices that sometimes we're not, we don't know they're there or we just wanna uplift all of those people. Um, and then previously we also did it with just celebrities and people who you might not know or Latino and like what they're doing right now. Um, so those are the, the big things that we've been in charge of this past few months. But in terms of our regular schedule, um, we meet once a rotation and we'll have simple meetings like Will said on, um, we did, we decorated cards for Thanksgiving. Um, we've had socials where we watch movies and eat pan dulce and we'll make out of the hot chocolate if you know what that is. Um, and it's basically just fostering community. And we've also made merch, which I see Olivia rocking all the time. Um, and like, that's my favorite part is like seeing people genuinely enjoy the club and the merch and wanting to come to the meetings. And that's what makes me want to push and continue to lead. Yeah, as Will and Julia have touched on, I think it's really just about building community. Uh, I'm a member of BSU. Last year, I was the outreach coordinator, reaching out to like freshmen and stuff to try and get them to join. Um, but I mean, being a black person at like is means being in, in the minority. And so like, it really helps to have groups like this where you can do anything from like play trivia during a tutorial and like start screaming at each other because it's like a competitive thing to like talking about different experiences you've had with microaggressions and stuff. Like it's, it's just a place where you can feel like you belong in a community. And I think that's really important to have at any place, but especially at a school like Lick. Oh, I also want to add something super quick. Like all of our affinity spaces like aren't like totally separate. Like we're not all just like our individual thing in like our own lane. We have something called the Students of Color Leadership Network, which is like, I think like it's run by someone who also like works in admissions, Gabby. And we meet, I think like around like once every rotation and we kind of just discuss how we can kind of combine all of our experiences as minorities in a predominantly white institution. And we've had like a bunch of mixers. I know next week we're having like a dialogue where each like each affinity club is collaborating with a different affinity club and hosting a dialogue, which I think is really important because it centers that experiences aren't like, like they, they may be different from minority to minority, but in a sense, like we are all connected and there is that sense of like solidarity there, which I really appreciate. Amazing, thanks for that. Okay, um, last question. Um, <clears throat> as you all reflect on um, when you were in the eighth grade and as you were choosing um, your your next school home, um, what advice would you give to the current eighth graders and, and their parents um, as they go through the process? Or, um, or perhaps uh, the question is, you know, what do you wish you knew about Lick 
um, when you were in the eighth grade that you now know about like? Everyone has to answer. Right. Um, I don't know if this is specifically supposed to be about the admissions process. Mine's not, but um, something I wish I knew about Lick is that like people embrace what they enjoy and it's, it's celebrated. And so like, if you have like a weird niche hobby that maybe like you don't wanna share, like at Lick, that's something that a lot of people, or like not a lot of people will be into, but people will respect that you enjoy that and maybe even ask you about it and things like that. And you can always find a place where uh, you can enjoy that hobby. So like for me, example, I play Magic the Gathering, super degenerate hobby, um, but super fun. And I started the club for it and found a bunch of people that also play. And that's been like a super fun community of people that I never thought I would get to know. Um, but just don't be afraid to share those hobbies, uh, especially when you're applying to, because um, those really stand out. Yeah, to add on to what Sakani said, um, yeah, people here are very much themselves and it's very refreshing, I must say. People are not afraid to share their opinions um, and their experiences. And I think that's something that we could have a lot more of in this world. Um, I'd also add on that from an admissions standpoint, um, I didn't really know that much about Lick when I applied. I just knew, wow, the shops sound cool. Um, and I can confirm they are. Um, but I would emphasize that Lick does an incredibly good job striking a balance between advocating for yourself and having um, adults who will support you in whatever you're advocating for. Um, so I know this year, I really, really wanted to get into a class known as Chem Honors. And there's only one block because there are only so many masochists at our school who decide they want to take Chem Honors. I was one of them. I did not get it at first and I was very disappointed. And so I tried um, talking to the scheduling lady and she said there's no availability, unfortunately. So I double checked with our dean, um, our sophomore, sorry, junior and senior dean, um, Dean Briggs, and talked with her. I said, if there's any availability, um, because she can see the shifting in classes, like, do you mind updating me? And turns out there was two weeks into when school started. And I was like, oh, yes. So um, I got the class I wanted. And it was because I stepped up and I talked to people um, who I knew could help me. And those adults in turn were willing to help me back to um, achieve my goals. And I think that's something that like does an incredible job of is striking a balance between having kids learn to advocate for themselves, but also being supportive of that advocacy. Um, maybe that's not always what the world will look like, but hopefully it could look more like that because that would be ideal. Um, one thing I would say is that at open houses, and those sorts of events, I get, a, I get a lot of questions where students are like, so what kind of like thing is admissions looking for? Like what kind of student like do I need to be? And I always just say like you, the admissions just wants you to see you be yourself and who you are. And like um, Sakani and Henrietta were saying like what your interests are and what unique sort of perspective that you bring because there's already so many different types of classes that like there's um like so many different arts like photography there's so many different little um, um electives and and different sorts of sciences and just all these sorts of um different classes that can appeal to so many different kinds of students um and so i feel like beyond just maybe you know test scores or that sort of thing i think what's really important is just how you know people bring themselves to the school and like what they um you know really what kind of experiences they really want to have and 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 that sort of thing so i think something that i would say is that the most important thing is just really who who you are and maybe who you want to like how you want to evolve also because there's so much time in high school to evolve into um all these different interests and all that sort of thing so i think just that sort of openness is is really important yeah, this mine kind of relates to what Olivia and Henrietta were both saying, but like for I, I think this is kind of like I don't know, this is this is gonna make me sound like I'm old, but like four years of high school goes by so fast. <laughs> and I hope that 
I hope Sakani and Julieta agree with me, but like do everything you can in high school. Like it's like an amazing place. I think no matter what high school you go to, you're going to have a place where you can, there's going to be so many opportunities for you to do great things. And Lick might be that place for you to go out there and do great things. But like, I guess also specifically at Lick, like it really fosters an environment for you to like try new things, which I think is so important in high school because I guess like approaching the college process now, sometimes there is like an expectation where it's like, oh, you need to know what you want to do. You need to like know your major. Like you need to like, know what your career path and I think that's kind of a narrative that like kind of fights against and I think like as eighth graders like enjoy your eighth grade year and like don't take it for granted um just all the experiences that you have in everything I sound like an old person <laughs> like <laughs> all the experiences that you have in life will like lead you on the right path so no matter where you go no matter like what experiences you have just like Put yourself out there and you will be successful in your own way. <laughs> okay. Sorry, my computer froze for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what I didn't know about Lick when I was applying, um, that is probably one of my favorite parts now, is how much it was going to prepare me for life in general past high school. Um, I really learned the skills that I need to be like an adult, I guess. Um, and not just like things that I'm gonna learn once and never take with me. Um, like for example, uh, like English class freshman year, um, things feel very tedious. Essays take two weeks, three weeks to finish because you go through every single process of outlining to the first paragraph, to transitions. And senior year, um, my history teacher assigned us an essay for homework. And if I was 14, I would have probably started panicking and crying, like, oh my God. But this year I was like, oh, okay. And like within 45 minutes I had done um, because I knew exactly what to do, what steps to take. And it felt simple to be able to just write. And that's something that I'm so glad that I can take with me. Um, and also I took um, my pre-calc class was a PPP class. So we learned about how to math mathematically model and how to think like a mathematician. Um, so I learned about credit score and all those things and how you can change them or how like new ways to think about the world. And that's something that I'm going to take with me and really rethink the way that I look at math and not just some algorithms that I'll remember once and forget later. So that's something that I'm very appreciative for. And then one thing that I would tell myself in eighth grade and tell you is that really think about your goals, how you want to push yourself and the things you want to achieve. Um, we want to be in four years and not just right now and go to the school that gives you the most tools and resources to be able to achieve those and which school can support you the best and who you want to become and who you are. Um, so I would really think about that. And if that's like, that's great, but really ultimately think about who you are and which school aligns with how you want to push yourself. You all make my job easy. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate you all for being here and sharing your insights. Um, and Will, I hate to break it to you, but you are getting old. Um, it happens. <laughs> um, but anyway, for all of our guests, thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time um, and your energy. And we hope that you found this to be helpful in your your high school search process. Um, as you continue to go through the next couple of months, if you have any questions for me um, or the admissions team, please feel free to reach out. Um, all of our information is on the website. Um, if you want to get in touch with one of our um, students as well to talk to them about their like experience, um, you will be able to do that. Um, and there's info on that uh, about how to do that online. Um, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend and hope to see you soon. See ya.